Hello. Hi there. I'm Medria. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, Brian. Hello. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Nichols. Hi, John. I'll start by giving you all a little bit of a rundown. First of all, this is the first episode I will have done with multiple guests at the same time. It might just be a different dynamic with three people. We cut for time, we cut for ums and ahs, and so we have we have a lot of space to... Um... To get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait a minute, we're, we're just talking about it today. We're not doing it today, right? Well, yeah. All right, so I want to know something. What the, what the fuck landed you in here? You didn't kill anybody. You're too skinny for a gangbanger. Oh, ain't that a bitch, all right? Don't judge a book by its cover, man. I can throw these things, all right? You know what I'm yeah, saying? Whatever, whatever. All right? Come on. Come on. What'd you do? Oh, man, it's none of your business, all right? It's embarrassing, all right? It's none of your goddamn business. <laughs> what? Embar everybody in here is embarrassed. You think nobody in here got away with anything? What'd you do? Man, I, I, I stole the TV, all right? So you stole a TV? What's embarrassing about that? I stole a TV from a store that was right next door to a donut shop, all right? I run out, the store owner's running behind me yelling, bam, I run into three cops, all right? <laughs> oh, see, see, I told you it was embarrassing, you laugh. Wait a second, wait a second. That doesn't make sense. Nah, you didn't get, you didn't get six years for stealing a TV, man. Come on. I go in the store, I come out, three hours of grass mower on the TV, falls on his foot and breaks they said I threw the TV at the office. So, six years. Come on, tell the truth. You chucked it at something. Like I said, I came out of the store, grabbed my arm, it fell on his foot. Well, I have a question for you, John, first. Sure, go ahead. Can you s tell us how you came upon our work? Mm-hmm, yes. Uh, my colleague, Rachel Newcomb. Oh, Rachel. I'll just be blunt about it. I basically was said, I have this feeling that this season needs to address something that we see in the news. And I don't know many psychoanalysts or psychologists of color. And I was wondering if you could point me to some resources that might lead me to interesting guests. And she gave me a list. And I am very interested in intersecting politics with this season and, and your paper really stood out to me in that respect. And, and John, you're a therapist? Mm-hmm. The ghosts of America's history of slavery are all around us. If you live in the South, it's sometimes concrete. Buildings, battlefields, and yes, flags and monuments. But everywhere in the country, we can find the traces of these ghosts. I first saw them face to face in my work with men on probation. In the scared eyes of someone who is going back to jail for a traffic violation. Maybe a traffic violation that I had recently only received a warning for. In a system that kept the poor poorer. Once I saw it face to face, I could not not see it everywhere. In the news of the things that were happening to black people, in the news of the things that weren't happening to white people. Ghosts. Hauntings. So this season, I'm asking each guest the question of how psychotherapy can address what we see happening in society. This is also, for some people, a question of how psychotherapy can intersect with other disciplines. Of course, when we ask this question to a psychoanalyst, they might answer about how the internal realities of the patient reflect their external world, and that when we work internally, we are working externally. But different disciplines offer more robust answers. And the engagement of psychotherapists with the political has always been a topic of some controversy. Our guests today write and speak on the topic of African American reparations, a topic that is often deemed political in a way that clearly presents reparations not as political, but as humanitarian. Brian Nichols and Medria Connolly are two psychotherapists in Los Angeles who have collaborated together for 30 years. 
Several years ago, when they discovered the journalism of ta Coates, their work took a different turn. His piece for The Atlantic, The Case for Reparations, inspired them to write their paper, Transforming Ghosts into Ancestors, Unsilencing the Psychological Case for Reparations to Descendants of American Slavery. You might recognize that phrase, transforming ghosts into ancestors, from our episode 23, That Which Haunts Us. In that episode, we interviewed the authors of Ghosts in the Consulting Room, and they share some source material with Dr. Nichols and Dr. Connolly from Hans Lowald, a psychoanalyst who in 1960 wrote, Those who know ghosts tell us that they long to be released from their ghost life and laid to rest as ancestors. As ancestors, they live forth in the present generation, while as ghosts, they are compelled to haunt the present generation with their shadow life. That idea of shadows is something that comes and goes throughout this season. Dr. Nichols and Dr. Connolly believe that not only has the rupture of American slavery left black people haunted in America, They believe we all have something psychological to gain by making reparations. And they spoke to me in January from their respective homes in L.A. How has the pandemic changed your clinical work and the nature of everything? Well, first of all, we're no longer in our offices. So let's let's start there. So since March, a year ago, I have been working from home on Zoom. Now, prior to the pandemic, for the most part, people came into the office. Since the pandemic, both Brian and I have been almost overwhelmed by the number of referrals that we have gotten. Not almost. Almost. Okay. (laughs) Not almost. For real overwhelmed mm-hmm. that that I had to add an additional day that's different the conferences that we were planning to participate in in person we ended up doing on zoom and needing to address all of the technology around that it's made us all very kind of technology focused in a way that we had not been before it has definitely definitely impacted the way in which we work, and I am not certain, quite frankly, when uh, we are all vaccinated, what the practice is going to look like. I would imagine, quite frankly, that I will have a hybrid model. So mm. When we first went home, I kind of had a little uncertainty about what was going to happen with, with practice. I, I thought maybe it was going to really get restricted. You know, I, I'm kind of a, unfortunately, an old dude, and so I'm not all that technologically comfortable. And people have been wanting me to do Skypes for years and I've always shied away from it. But all of a sudden I came home and, you know, you could do it all day, every day. And people were good with it. People people were sitting around at home, especially those first couple of weeks, they were waiting for their therapy appointment Mm -hmm. uh, because there wasn't much else to do. (laughs) And also they needed it. Mm -hmm. I've not heard so much suicidal ideation as I've heard this past year. Mm -hmm. And then anxiety. And then, of course, then it's not just the pandemic. Then it becomes George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And for us as African-American therapists, you know, we're hearing all kinds of stuff. So if there's two themes that that really jumped out to me this year, it was in in sessions. It was about more conversations about suicidal ideation and many more conversations about guns, Mm -hmm. (laughs) about getting guns. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Absolutely. One of the things that I really thought was interesting about your paper is addressing that white shame. I really believe that shame is one of the most destabilizing emotions we can we can experience. I think shame often generates rage or it generates all kinds of responses. But it felt to me like it was one of the biggest barriers to coming to terms with our racial issues, our racial problems. There's shame in the, on the side of the victimizer, of perpetrator, to have behaved that way. But usually that shame gets projected outward and denied. And then the victims often carry the shame, the shame of victimhood. 
Mm. So the victims walked around all filled with the shame. The perpetrators projected it out and just going on about his business, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then when we have to say, wait, hold up, you know, the thing that you did there, that was pretty awful. What? I, me? I could do something awful, terrible? That's the, that's the tough moment to hold somebody in that spot. I've truly thought a lot about how to, how to have that conversation without getting stuck in shame. Mm -hmm. In our article, you'll see that we, we, we rely on a couple of people to help us think about that. One, one of our friends here, Lynn, Lynn Jacobs, and her, her article that I just love to repeat the name of Learn to Love Your White Shame and Guilt. <laughs> Lean into the shame. Because then on the other side is a kind of remorseful growth, an appreciation for things in a broader way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to destroy you. You don't have to stay stuck in it. Mm -hmm. And then our friend, a, a political theorist in Scotland, Mihaila Mihai, says, you know, you don't have to just feel shame. You can also feel courage that you're the generation of people that are now taken on this issue and moved us forward. No matter what, as you move forward, and then Medri has been reading things recently that, that really highlight this, you can't get around remorse. You can't get around sorrow. So you've got to be able to contain that, but not get stuck in it and keep moving with action. Hmm. Right. From Brian and Medria's paper on the psychological case for reparations. While guilt, defined as feeling bad about one does or feels, is clearly a powerful emotional impediment, we actually think that shame, defined as feeling bad about what one is, is an even more crippling experience. Recognition that the ghosts of slavery are still present, that white privilege extends from a murderous history, that notions of meritocracy may be self-serving distortions of reality, squarely locate white Americans in the position of perpetrator. We suggest that all these factors represent a narcissistic wound, often resulting in all manner of disassembling, and in some cases, rage. Shame is often a disabling and overwhelming emotion that tends to generate behaviors designed to kill the messenger since shame feels like an indictment of the soul, the experience is one of helplessness to correct the situation. This, then, represents a massive problem for those of us advocating reparations as the salve to heal the profound historical wounds of this country. I have a, another paper to present with the A.K. Rice Institute the title of that paper is, How Can We Talk About Reparations at a Time Like This? In doing that, I began to reread Eichmann in Jerusalem by Hannah Arendt. Not the book, but the New Yorker edited version of that, in which she's kind of chronicling this trial of Eichmann in Jerusalem and really thinking very deeply, very thoughtfully about how that process kind of transpired. And one of the phrases that she uses in that article is, justice requires sorrow, not anger. And it really kind of stuck with me. She was using it in the context of this trial that was, despite the best efforts of the judges, that was really moving into spectacle as opposed to actually chronicling the offenses that were perpetrated and who was involved in that. And it was interesting because she also talked about the emphasis focused more on the suffering of Jewish people versus the acts of the perpetrator and kind of chronicling that. Essentially, she was saying that if the response is solely a response of anger, then what that's going to activate is revenge. That one would need to really move past that to appreciate the sorrow that is there around this crime against humanity, and then work from that place in order to achieve justice. We're playing a game of three-dimensional chess. Mm -hmm. How do you, in the role of the former victim, 
behave in such a way that can help promote the engagement with remorse? How do they get to remorse? How do we sidestep revenge to this moment where a true joining can occur around an appropriately remorseful atonement mm -hmm. that can kind of move us into a different future? Mm -hmm. That's our focus. It's not just about the money or the material. Although the money and the material is important, it's very important, mm -hmm. but it's not just so people can get paid. Mm -hmm. It's to make for a better world. Our, our friend Shaquille Chaudhry, he wrote a book, Deep Diversity, Overcoming Us Versus Them. He's really now turned toward the writings of Martin Luther King. And he reminds us that in the activist world, so much of the time we're fighting against something, against something that feels wrong and evil. But he worries that if all we do is fight against something, we'll get stuck in that kind of angry, revengeful position, which is something that Klein would talk about. Mm. And that's that we need a vision of where we're going. It's not what we're, just what we're fighting against. What are we fighting for? And he talked about King highlighting the beloved community. I haven't always tried to just go back to King. It feels so easy, but the, the moment feels so appropriate. I can't find a better way to describe kind of what I've been envisioning in my own mind, I can't find a better way to describe it than it's the beloved community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, what makes the psychological case complex is the fact that for King, obviously in envisioning the beloved community, he was murdered right. and, and he knew he would be. Yeah. And he was prepared to sacrifice right. his life in the service of this vision. With Eichmann, he never acknowledged being wrong. There was no remorse. There was no acknowledgement of having done anything wrong up until they hung him. And still, he held on to the line that I was just following orders. Mm -hmm. How do we hold the complexity of this while focusing on a vision of a beloved community? It's challenging. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot there. We talk about shame and we talk about sorrow, which feel like two states of mind that our culture tends to find pretty intolerable. Yes. And I start to think about what would I do with a patient who found a feeling intolerable. And I think about embodiment and sitting mm -hmm. with that feeling. I don't feel like we are a culture that is moving more towards embodiment mm -hmm. and experiencing those feelings. Well, yeah, well, this is not a popularity contest. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, I, then I'm going to contradict myself because as people who are trying to be activists on behalf of this it does need to be something of a popularity contest. Mm. We need to sell sorrow. <laughs> remorse. How's that working for us? <laughs> hey, come on, feel a little more remorseful. Come on, let's engage that shame. How about it? <laughs> what is this, this term, make the revolution irresistible? Yeah, come on. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just to give you some background, I am, I'm from the Southeast. My dad is Wasp. My mom is a Jew. And both of them are politically conservative, but it's interesting to see in the last year her fall into remorse and him double down. And whereas it used to be generational, you know, the millennial generation against the baby boomer generation politically, mm -hmm. it's starting to feel this feeling of any of us with some degree of otherness, seeing some of the light here mm -hmm. and to see him double down, mm. you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's startling. And it, mm -hmm. it's a hard sell. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, what a, what a provocative story <laughs> for us as you tell that. The audiences that have welcomed us have been largely white psychoanalysts. We're speaking to the willing and the interested. We aren't speaking to the double down. But we get asked that question, what about those folks? I have a hard time ignoring that. On one hand, I want to say, I'm just going to do my thing. I can't worry I can't worry about that I don't, because I, I really don't have a good answer for it. Mm -hmm. But the answer I have had has been, white people, talk to your people. Mm -hmm. You're better at talking to your people than I'm going to be at talking to your people. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm assuming that somebody in your family is, there's a cousin or somebody in there that you might have a relationship with that sees it in another way that might be slightly open to you. And that's what we count on. So and when I think strategically, if we can consolidate the willing and the interested so that things like white fragility don't predominate and a kind of a, just sort of a, a me focus on guilt and shame don't predominate, that we get through it and we can actually create a collective action. If we can consolidate on that side, then all of those on that side who have any link on the other try to leverage your relationship in a caring and loving, but firm way. Maybe that makes the difference. I do believe the best hope is in the relationship and mm -hmm. in working mm -hmm. with the connection as a way of trying to convince resistant folks mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be more, at least, open to the possibility. And that would be a step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, Medria, it strikes me, it's like doing psychotherapy. Yes. You don't walk down the street and look at people and go, huh, you look like you might benefit from therapy. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're reliant upon people saying, you know, I, this is something I need some help with. That is the foundation of the therapeutic alliance. Mm -hmm. I don't feel in this matter that we can walk up to people with that hostile, angry, kind of arrogant stance that they all seem to have and then start to talk about reparations. Well, I see you're really hateful, but let me tell you about reparations. I don't, I don't see that. But if the question came up, I'd love to talk about it. I just need to feel there's any level of interest at all. Then we can talk. Some degree of alliance. That's not even an alliance. That's just like opening. If we get to alliance, yeah, that's, that's wonderful. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I'm not going to walk up to a dude in a flatbed truck with a bunch of flags waving, chewing tobacco and spitting, and start telling, hey, let me give you the good news about reparations. <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not getting shot out there. <laughs> that is exactly right. You will get yourself killed. <laughs> Again, from Brian and Medria's paper on the psychological case for reparations. Protected by the insulated environments described by Robin D'Angelo, moral injury operates at a deep emotional level in the American psyche. The challenge of acknowledging moral injury is that when the acknowledgement is done right, it is accompanied by a fragility that may cover the emotions of shame, guilt, unworthiness, and or despair. To cope with that experience, white Americans often double down. With a righteous anger that helps fuel the angry backlash we see whenever there is movement towards equality. To view African Americans as equals threatens to activate moral injury. For in the realization of black people as equally worthy is the horror of one's active or complicit participation in dehumanizing them. What in particular brought you all to the work of writing about reparations? So for years, in addition to my work in practice, I've always wanted to do work in the community. Um, I got trained in a program called Effective Black Parenting right out of graduate school, and I've been around the country training people in that program. I got trained in an anger management program, uh, that was designed for African-American youth. So with that training, I eventually got hired at this community-based organization as a contractor when they were starting a gang prevention program in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles, you know, is a hotbed of gang activity. And I, I was really so happy to be able to get involved. After many years working there, we were getting all these resources, like $10 million a year, eventually $15 million a year, but we weren't progressing. The thing that I usually tell is that I got involved in about 1997, I think it was, with a program that was called LA Bridges. It was mostly after school programming and based around middle school. In that first year, they gave a million dollar contract to an organization to do evaluation. Any of these kind of programs need evaluation so you can document what you're doing right and wrong. Mm. They never did the evaluation. 
something happened, and in a formal evaluation, it never occurred. Now it gets thrown to the whims of political sentiment. So the city decided to reconfigure it, and they changed the whole program. This time, they were really determined, we're going to get an evaluation. They got some researchers in Washington, researchers at USC. They had a whole prospect. So they gathered all of us together one day, all of us were providers. And the providers were about 15 organizations around the city in different pockets of the city. So you come together, and you got providers, black and brown providers, for the most part. And then you got you got the city bureaucrats, then you got white researchers from Washington and white researchers from USC. And the researchers from Washington begin to unfold this long story about what their approach to the evaluation is going to be. And they begin to talk about how they're going to use the gold standard of research, which the gold standard is randomized control treatment, which requires random assignment to group. Now, understanding in gang work in Los Angeles, there was something completely new already in that we had a form that assessed risk. The youth had to meet criteria on that form for us to even take them into the program. You know, typically you get a referral from a school or whatever, you take them in and you work with them. But now we get the referral, we take them in and we assess them, and we start kicking some back. Hmm. Not just a couple. We're kicking back initially 50% of the kids that refer to us. Mm. So now, in addition to that, of the ones that are qualify, we're supposed to randomly bring in half of them and randomly kick another half out to, to do what? I don't know. Just sit around and wait so you can have that control group. As the black and brown people in the audience were listening to this, they were shaking their heads. What? No, no. Way. Are you kidding me? You must be crazy. You think you... <laughs> so they were reacting, and eventually, as one of really one of maybe two psychologists in the city involved in this. I raised my hand and I said, hey, you know, you guys, you're talking about presenting us with the, with the gold in terms of research methodology. But, you know, we've been out here for 12 years with nothing. I'll take the bronze. You have quasi-experimental designs available to you. And they looked at me like it was like laser beams coming out their eyes going through the back of my head. Like, who's that guy? What are you talking about? I'm messing up their whole program now. And they were shaking their heads. And so as we left the meeting, I looked at them and I thought, they're shaking their heads looking at us like poor little people of color. You just don't know what's good for you. And then the people of color were walking out. One of my colleagues says, mm, boy, this is just like Tuskegee up in here. I said, Tuskegee, really? Tuskegee? She said, yeah, you know how they do. They take advantage, whatever they can, for the sake of their research. I'm like, oh, man. So I started thinking about it. I was like, wait a minute. These white people and black and white, we all came together with, I think, a good purpose. We're trying to make things better for kids who get sidetracked into a really difficult situation. Mm -hmm. I got to believe these are good people. But something, it's like there was something hovering over the room. They grabbed us and didn't allow us to collaborate. And then we end up breaking down in very typical racial ways. With the white folks, I felt, looking down at us patronizingly. And the black folks feeling suspicious and fearful of exploitation. And it just felt like, God. And, and I could give you about a half a dozen other examples of how these multiracial collaborations with good intentions fall apart. I'm like, there is something going on that's invisible to us that undermines our best efforts. It sounds like that's related to the Hans Lowald idea of ghosts. Well, yes. at the moment I was in that meeting, I didn't know Hans Lowald. But I came to know him later. This show was a hard one to edit. That's why it's going to end up being a two-parter. There's just too much stuff I wanted to keep in. Normally, in our show, we try to edit our interviews down to what we consider the meat of each interview. This usually involves quite a bit of editing out the mundane parts of our job. People going to conferences, reading books, having lunch with colleagues, etc. It's not that it's not important. It's that we feel the need to make our show as compelling as possible for you, the listener. Which is why I thought it was important to include the stories Brian and Mendria are telling about conferences and their jobs. The stories you're hearing of Brian's experience in a research study and the one you're about to hear of Mendria's experience of a conference attendee presented what seems like a colonization fantasy as a case study of counter-transference. These stories aren't just stories of therapists networking with each other. They're meta-narratives 
of how the ghosts that haunt African Americans follow them even into the field we are part of. These are stories of how power dynamics take shape among my colleagues and what folks like Brian and Medria are up against, even in what should be a relationally enlightened field. Like Brian, I have been doing lots of work, both in private practice and in the community, working in the juvenile justice system, et cetera, but yeah, about 30 plus years of, of work. And I'd also been attending a conference here in LA that was sponsored by UCLA for many years. In that conference in which, I don't know, 700, 800, 1,000 people would attend, what was conspicuously absent were people of color who were attendees for that weekend conference, as well as presenters of color. I was asked to participate in presenting at that conference, introducing the theme of culture, because one of the complaints that we had was that, okay, you're doing all of these presentations on, you know, neurobiology, nothing is being mentioned about the context in which any of this is is playing out. It's as if culture doesn't matter. And it does. So it was decided that culture would be introduced into the theme for the following spring. I agreed. I was asked if I would work with a, a white female clinician. Uh, she had a training tape in which she was interviewing a black female client. And she wanted me to review that and point out what she, as a white clinician, missed in doing this work. So there was a, a year lead up to this, and I was fretting about it. I was very anxious. And Brian was hearing all about it, all, all, all of the details. So, as it turned out, the membership for that conference in which culture was introduced in the theme was far below the numbers that it had been before. So they were going to lose money for the first time ever on one of their conferences. And of course, it was kind of our fault as they saw it because Mm -hmm. we were the ones that said, you know, you need to introduce culture. So, So that was additional pressure. And in the process of preparing my part of this presentation, again, I was doing a lot of reading and and two books kind of stood out. They informed my thinking about reparations, even though I wasn't thinking about reparations. And those two books were Slavery and Social Death by Orlando Patterson, who's a sociologist, and Between Their World and Me Mm. by Ta-Nehisi Oates. First of all, slavery and social death, it's a comparative study, kind of laid me out. It was daunting looking at the entire history of slavery, comparing different slave systems and appreciating that the system of chattel slavery that we introduced here in the States is considered the worst system of slavery in the history of slavery. So there is that. And then reading Tadahasi Coates. And so I was telling Brian, you know, you really have to read this. Anyway, we had this conference. Our presentation went very well, but the good work that we had spent a year planning for got undone at the very end of that three day period because a white male psychoanalyst who was invited to present interpreted the theme of that conference as an invitation to share in graphic detail his sexual fantasies about two of his black clients. Now, this enraged the attendees. It was exploring counter-transfer. Yes. But dude, no. But no. (laughs) People were running for the exit. And we were like, but wait, this is the last presentation of the three-day thing. There was a summation 
of the three days in which, I don't know, essentially the, the message was culture does not matter as if we had not spent three days building, you know, this. And so at the end of this, I was, I was devastated by it. In the fall, Brian was being given an award for his community service by IFPI. He read ta Coates's The Case for Reparations. In 2014, The Atlantic published ta Coates's The Case for Reparations, a history of the trauma caused not only by the American slave trade, but by the century plus of malicious inequity perpetrated against the black community through subtle and not so subtle methods. One note about the readings you'll hear in these episodes. Originally, I recorded this commentary myself, reading everything. Afterwards, it felt strange to me to hear Mr. Coates's piece in my voice. It didn't feel so strange to read Brian and Medria's paper. While it is important that they're black psychologists, they are writing to my community as well. The we is us as practitioners. The we in ta Coates's article is African Americans. I felt off as I read it myself. Even though in most of our episodes I read all of the commentary myself, it felt strange. So we hired our friend Carl Cadwell, a music producer in Tennessee, to read the voice of ta Coates. In this piece, Coates tells us the story of Clyde Ross, an army vet who ended up fighting corrupt real estate contractors in Chicago of the 1960s after being taken advantage of himself. Coates describes this as a generational reoccurrence as he tells us about Clyde's upbringing. When Clyde Ross was still a child, Mississippi authorities claimed his father owed $3,000 in back taxes. The elder Ross could not read. He did not have a lawyer. He did not know anyone at the local courthouse. He could not expect the police to be impartial. Effectively, the Ross family had no way to contest the claim and no protection under the law. The authorities seized the land. They seized the buggy. They took the cows, hogs, and mules. And so for the upkeep of separate but equal, the entire Ross family was reduced to sharecropping. This was hardly unusual. In 2001, the Associated Press published a three-part investigation into the theft of black-owned land stretching back to the antebellum period. The series documented some 406 victims and 24,000 acres of land valued at tens of millions of dollars. The land was taken through means ranging from legal chicanery to terrorism. Some of the land taken from black families has become a country club in Virginia, the AP reported, as well as oil fields in Mississippi and a baseball spring training facility in Florida. And when I read that, then I I became a convert. I just was like, oh my God, this is it. Because I had been asking for years, how can we go through civil rights and all the the big movement we had 50 years ago and things still aren't great? There's some gains, there's some economic, I'm not gonna deny that, but why are so many of us in prison? How come our health disparities are so, so great? How come our educational disparities remain terrible? What happened? And when I read Ta-Nehisi Coates' article, it, it answered the question for me. You can't have a crime against humanity that was slavery, not properly and fully atone for it, and expect things to be different. That's where it got to me. And then I started, he did his case for reparations, and I thought, but what about the psychological aspects of reparations? What would it mean to us psychologically to have reparations? You, you need to appreciate, because his hair was on fire. Okay, he was so excited about this. And he was like, I'm going to work on reparations. He's like, you have to read, you have to read the case for reparations. And I hadn't even read it yet. I'd read Between the World and Me, but I hadn't read it. But at this conference where he was presenting and talking about this doing and undoing and that the reason that our efforts keep getting undone is because there is something 
fundamentally wrong that has not been addressed that will continue to undo our best efforts here. And unless we begin to address that fundamental problem. And so he is talking about this at the conference and I'm sitting there, you know, listening. And in that moment, I thought, I'm going to join you in this effort because I was completely moved by his enthusiasm. We joke because he said to me, oh, well, you don't think my shoulders are big enough to do this uh, alone? And I said, I don't think you should have to. And he said, okay. So we were like, okay, so we're going we're gonna to do the psychological case for reparations. We envisioned it as a companion piece to ta Coates's The Case for Reparation. And our friend Shaquille Chaudhry, who just had the conference that, that uh, and the book Deep Diversity that we're referring to, who was also at the conference, said, oh, and I know just where you're going to present it. Your first presentation is going to be at the White Privilege Conference. And Brian and I are like, at the what? We've never even heard of the White Privilege Conference. Said, yes, 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 you know, you're going to do it there. And then the next one is going to be at the People of Color Conference. And then, and so we jokingly referred to Shaquille as our manager because he knew about all of these conferences. And, and that's how the concept was born. This is a clear example of done and undone. There was a psychoanalytic institute here spurred by one of our colleagues trying to really deal with this issue of how we're haunted by racial issues. They did a day-long seminar on something they titled Slavery Shadow. Now, this is before I even got to reparate. This was probably about 2014. Slave, I'm like, Slavery Shadow? I, I got to go to that. I got to go. And so we go and, you know, it's probably about 80 people in the room. 10 people of color, everybody else white. I found it almost like a confessional. People talking about their kind of how they had engaged in activities that they recognized were covertly racist. The implicit racism was, I think, a theme of that morning. One woman presented the man who was like a butler in her home in Tennessee. And she had his picture behind him, the black man, as she presented in a way to sort of belatedly honor how significant he was in her life, really the father figure in her life while her father, who was wealthy, was somewhat alcoholic but distant. And so she honored him and it was really emotional. She was tearful and that whole morning, I called it like a, a kumbaya moment. It was a kumbaya morning. We were you know, crying and wanting to hug and it was so beautiful. <laughs> So then we go to lunch. Then we start having little small groups and we're talking about stuff and people are really getting into it. And then we convene at the, at the end of the day, the whole group comes together. And in the middle of talking, there's this one guy, he's from New York, an analyst. And he'd already made some comments in the morning that, you know, he was talking about Django, the movie was a black exploitation movie. And I was like, wow, God, I'm glad you told me that, that I'm self-hating. I didn't realize that. He comes at the end of the day, he says, you know, I want to say, that we spent this whole day talking about how America is a place that's racist and it's really a terrible place, but I want to remind us that America is really a great place. And I dare say, the best place on earth for African Americans to live. Now, I'm really just there. I brought a couple of my associates. I'm trying to make net, I'm trying to do business. I'm trying to have people network. And I'm, I'm like, did he just say that? And so I'm like, I'm trying to be calm. I'm trying to compose a thoughtful, measured response. But, you know, the temperature is rising quickly and all I can hear myself saying out loud is, now you didn't said too much. <laughs> and it, it just I went on a rant, you know, and it just kind of was a whole thing. And I, talking to him about, I told him, you know, I live well, I got a nice car, but too many of my brethren are in prison. Have you heard of something called mass incarceration? Yeah. It went like that. The white folks around me got kind of got hushed. Some people stood up and supported my point of view, but I felt like people were like giving me a wide berth. And so my associate says to me, ooh, Dr. Nichols, you really shut that down. And I was like, yeah, good for me. I shut that down, but now I'm the angry black man. And we finished the day right where we started. No different. I'm angry. People have backed off from me. They're not talking much anymore. <laughs> and it gets all undone. He obviously felt attacked and then he 
push you into confirming his suspicion about feeling attacked. And right, and I played my part, and I hated it. Yeah. I played my part in the play. I've gone over in my head over and over again, was there something I could have done different? Mm. And now, I got some inspiration in the readings and conversations, frankly, with Jessica Benjamin. Mm. But it's something about getting out of the do or done to situation. I thought, you know what? I still could have said some of what I needed to say, but I needed to comment to him about my appreciation for him having suffered all these challenges to something that was an ideal for him. We're challenging his ideal uh, of America. And I needed to show some respect for that, even if that ideal was part of crushing me. And then I began to think, I think the man was Jewish. And I through some conversations with a friend of mine, I began to recognize what America could have meant for those Jewish immigrants on the, at the end of the Holocaust, how America welcomed them. Sure, but as a as a great grandson of some of those ind- immigrants, you know, I think the complexity there is that my Jewish mother moved to the South and slipped right in, right, and was able to hide her otherness. And so for the people that I'd come from, it was that dream. You were pushing up against his fantasy of that shining city on a hill. Right. And I thought, this is what we work with. The people who are interested, the people who feel, who've been victimized, we still need to have some sensitivity to that challenge. That doesn't need to carry the day, but I need to be sensitive to it. And, and even if I was sensitive to it, I don't know if it would have made a difference. But as I interrogate myself, I look at, is there something else I could do there? Mm -hmm. Now, it takes a lot to do that. I'm going to say it would take a lot to show empathy in the face of that kind of comment. Mm -hmm. You see the measures reading about Hannah Arendt, and we we look a lot at at Germany and its recovery after the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. When Jews came here, it looks to me like for the price for America welcoming them is they had to become white. Mm -hmm. Jews had to turn white, and they had to kind of start to limit their Jewishness in some way. These are the other books that we have been reading. I'm a big fan of Susan Nyman's book, Learning from the Germans, Race and the Memory of Evil, in which she does a comparative analysis of what happened in Germany and how reparations came about. And where the resistance is here in the United States around providing reparations to the descendants of American slavery. Mm -hmm. It is a wonderful book. Mm -hmm. The other kind of a correlate is Michael Rothberg's book, The Implicated Subject, which is also wonderful. And then to add to that, we have Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, which really weave some of what Susan Nyman was talking about in her book with some of the points that are being made in Isabel Wilkerson's book. So all of this, it's up. Mm -hmm. The conversation is definitely with us. And on a macro level, because we, we oftentimes talk about the fact that we're always working on these micro levels, you know, one to one individually and noticing things being done and then undone. But when we started looking at it on a macro basis, I mean, we have Brian and I joke about the saying, once you go Mac, you never go back. So, uh, so that is that's our our ongoing joke around this. But on boom, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> this is a topic that points towards policy. There is a running theme through our our field that politics don't belong in treatment. There's there's a history of saying you know, well, that doesn't belong in the treatment room. What belongs in the treatment room is what's inside the patient's mind and as if we can separate them. And so I'm wondering on an academic level or intellectual level, what kind of pushback that the two of you have come up against? In that first presentation I made back there in 2016, one of the analysts who's now a pretty good friend of mine, he he raised a question that essentially can't we just work this out in the therapy room? Doesn't the cumulative effect of good psychotherapy then resonate outward into society and make it, you know, make things better? And my comment to him was, you know, I want you to do good work with your people, do good work in in therapy. 
But just know that when you release them from your therapy office, you release them into a toxic environment, mm. a, a toxic culture. It's like air pollution hovering. And it is really sickening your people in a way that is so much more powerful than what one-to-one -one relations can do. Just stay aware of that. If you believe that you can work one-to-one -one without accounting for that toxic experience, I think you're kind of deluding yourself. Now, I don't think it's for us to have a political mission with our clients. We can't just like slice it off, compartmentalize it, pretend that this is not going on outside the office. Whatever happened to you in your life and how you see it is embedded in a cultural context. Mm -hmm. Where do you live? Where are you from? Where are your people from? Where, what brought them where they got to? How, how, did, how did you come to be? That's all involved the political and the cultural scene. I'm not trying to cut that out of the equation as I listen to people talk. It's also, as we have come to appreciate because we have been in practice for such a long time, there is an inherent European bias in the way in which the theory is conceptualized. You know, we've all been trained in a particular model, which initially we took up assuming that that's the way it was supposed to be. But it's been only in time and practice that we're, we recognized it and began to kind of interrogate the model around, okay, well, what is not being said here? What kind of cultural assumptions are being made here? And by whom? And how is it that the whole notion of the mind and the individual is being privileged over a mind, body, soul connection and the context of community. You know, we began to question that. Moreover, since Brian and I, you know, have clients who are mostly people of color, I mean, we're clear. There is no way that any person of color is going to come into therapy and not talk about their experiences in the world as a person of color. And part of the reason that they are seeking out clinicians of color is so they don't have to explain any of that, but that we know exactly what they're talking about. And so there is a movement between what's happening to them as individuals within the context of their family systems and their own personal history and how that is affected by what's happening culturally and in the community. And so there's this kind of fluidity back and forth between the two that they look for in a treatment paradigm and which we provide. Mm -hmm. Suppose one of my, my African-American clients starts coming to me and talking about, well, you know, Doc, I'm looking at the news and I'm thinking, I need to get me a gun. And I'd say, you know, yes, but before you do that, let's explore how the relationship with your mother might be influencing your thinking about getting a gun. <laughs> let's just look at that. <laughs> oh, hell no. <laughs> Out of curiosity, what questions do you ask to that patient? Oh, boy. Well, one of the questions I ask, just like I've asked myself and I've asked Medrid, well, when you get the gun, who are you going to shoot? <laughs> who are you going to shoot? I mean, are you imagining, is somebody going to come into your house? Uh, are you going to take it to the protest? Are you going to take it to your office? Are you going to carry it in your car? Where mm -hmm. is it that the threat, that you're going to fend off that threat? Mm -hmm. Now, I've actually had some people who live in homes and they're like, I'm worried about somebody actually coming into my house. I have a guy who lives in the valley in a more integrated area. He's like, you know, I see people in their trucks driving up and down the street. I don't know if any of them is going to come on me. Mm -hmm. And some people say, I don't know who I might shoot. I just want that feeling of security. Now, mm -hmm. in my mind, I don't reach for a gun for a feeling of security, but many people do. I'm not a gun advocate. I don't own a gun. But if they want to get a gun, I refer them to the black gun owner out in Burbank. Right, right. <laughs> 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 you are taught to abstract the concrete things that our clients are saying to us. If you're afraid of a concrete danger, that represents an abstract mm -hmm. danger that you experience right. in your mind. Right. But when you see... And when I got shot, I was representing death. Exactly. Like when you, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> What did that mean to me? <laughs> For a person of color, getting pulled over by the cops is not an abstract 
fear. It is a concrete fear. And so they want, your clients want to do something concrete about a concrete fear. Right. But they also want an opportunity to think about it, to talk about it. But but not me dismiss it, dismiss the real thing. Mm-hmm. How misattuned would that be? Tanahasi Coates again from the case for reparations. In 1961, Ross and his wife bought a house in North Lawndale, a bustling community on Chicago's west side. North Lawndale had long been a predominantly Jewish neighborhood, but a handful of middle-class African Americans had lived there starting in the 40s. The community was anchored by the sprawling Sears Roebuck headquarters. North Lawndale's Jewish People's Institute actively encouraged blacks to move into the neighborhood, seeking to make it a pilot community for interracial living. In the battle for integration then being fought across the country, North Lawndale seemed to offer promising terrain. But out in the tall grass, highwaymen, nefarious as any Clarksdale kleptocrat, were lying in wait. Three months after Clyde Ross moved into his house, the boiler blew out. This would normally be a homeowner's responsibility, but in fact, Ross was not really a homeowner. His payments were made to the seller, not the bank, and Ross had not signed a normal mortgage. He had bought on contract, a predatory agreement that combined all the responsibilities of home ownership with all the disadvantages of renting, while offering the benefits of neither. Ross had bought his house for $27,500. The seller, not the previous homeowner, but a new kind of middleman, had bought it for only $12,000, six months before selling it to Ross. In a contract sale, the seller kept the deed until the contract was paid in full. And, unlike a normal mortgage, Ross would acquire no equity in the meantime. If he missed a single payment, he would immediately forfeit his $1,000 down, all his monthly payments, and the property itself. The men who peddled contracts in North Lawndale would sell homes at inflated prices and then evict families who could not pay, taking their down payment and their monthly installments as profit. I went back and read the uh, case for reparations uh, by Mr. Coates, and my, my Jewish mom comes from Chicago. So there's a part where he's talking about Clyde, and he's talking about him moving into this neighborhood of, of Jews in Chicago, uh, where they do the contract home ownership. I notice in myself, I'm starting to think, we're part of the good guys here. I go on to read that this fella in Chicago was taken advantage of, and there was a whole system. And, and I start to feel the shame creep in, right? Of like, man, even my Yankee relatives, I can't escape the culpability. And you talk about this in your writing. You already mentioned Lynn Jacobs talking about white people learning to love and engage with their shame. I guess my question is, how? It goes back to like that issue of like, what do we do with double down people? Well, we probably don't engage with people who don't recognize they have something they need to work on. But we're not talking right now about them. We're talking about you. Next time on Between Us. Democracy is like that beautiful club where people are inside that club and all voices are respected and people may disagree, but they, they agree to disagree, they, they, they debate and it's wonderful. But meanwhile, you got some black folks outside the club knocking at the door, battling with the bouncer. This has been Between Us. Our thanks to Brian Nichols and Medria Connolly, who will be with us next time to continue the discussion on the psychological case for reparations. Our voice actor is Carl Cadwell of the band Summer Dregs. Between Us is produced by myself and Mason Neely, who also composes our music. Our research assistant is Rose Bergdahl. To connect with Between Us, find us where you find podcasts and subscribe. Also find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Mason and I have also been posting conversations between the two of us on YouTube as our free association series. Be sure to check it out. And until next time, take care.